If you've ever had a pet or known someone with a pet, you probably know what a roundworm is. But did you know that these are nematodes? 180 years of visualizing these fascinating worms gives us insight into biodiversity, evolution, and marine ecosystems. This week, Dr. Holly Bick from the University of California, Riverside, guides us through an exploration of these mysterious deep sea creatures using both ancient and novel techniques. Don't know much biology. Hello and welcome to Radio Bio. I am Akshay. And I'm Genevieve. Uh, we are joined here by Dr. Holly Bick, Assistant Professor in the Department of Nematology at the University of California, Riverside. So can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how did you end up working with uh, in the department? Department of Neurotology. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I grew up in Boston on the East Coast in Massachusetts, and uh, I did my PhD overseas uh, in London at the Natural History Museum. Um, so I focused on taxonomy during my PhD. So I was working with um, nematode worms, which are roundworms, which is what I still work with today. Uh, that's why I'm in the Department of Nematology. And uh, as a postdoc, I transitioned over to computational biology. So I started learning um, computer programming. I had done molecular biology, so PCR and DNA sequencing during my uh, PhD, but then I decided to get more into that and, and learn programming and learn how to deal work with uh, larger data sets during my postdoc. And um, nowadays, my research spans um, morphological taxonomy, uh, so identifying things under the microscope all the way to genome sequencing and um, building uh, computational tools like data visualization approaches. Interesting. So... Um what are nematodes? Nematodes are more commonly known as roundworms. So they are uh, thin, thread-like worms that are pointy at both ends. That's the easiest way to describe them. You probably have heard of nematodes, even if you might not know it. So um, dog heartworm is a nematode. Um, Enterobius is pinworm, which is a like a, a parasite that a lot of kids get. Um, then you have more um, globally relevant nematode parasites. So you have uh, Ascarius, Onchocerciasis, river blindness. Uh, those are both nematodes um, in important tropical diseases uh, that affect millions of people worldwide. So most of the things that we know about nematodes and most people, what most of what people would know about nematodes are actually more biased towards the parasitic species. And then, of course, we have C. elegans, which is the most famous nematode uh, of a model organism that we use in molecular biology and um, can be cultured in the lab. So you did do your PhD work in uh, nematode kind of taxonomy stuff originally. So what kind of drew you into that research to begin with, like going into grad school? <laughs> I sort of discovered nematodes by accident. Not sort of. I definitely discovered nematodes by accident. I wanted to do a PhD in molecular biology. And so I, I love genetics and DNA sequencing. And I knew that's what I wanted to do my PhD on. And um, I just really, um, I've always been, I mean, the reason I got into science was because I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I wanted to work in the ocean and, and work in uh, marine systems. And I just happened to um, find a PhD project uh, that was doing both of those things, but happened to be working on nematodes. And um, I said, sure, okay. I, I knew I didn't want to work on vertebrates. That was my only uh, stipulation. So I was hoping for jellyfish, but I ended up with nematodes. And um, yeah, and I just stuck with them ever since. Because once you know more about nematodes, they're just, uh, they're such an interesting, like, little case study to use for these bigger questions in, in ecology and evolution. It's actually quite a range of, like, things like going from just the actual morphology of like what do these things look like to like what their actual genes are and like what's contributing to what they're doing um so specifically what kinds of like how do you actually do this research like how do you look do this like large span of from just what they look like and the actual like genes and sequencing them 
Yeah, so the first step is to go collect your samples. So I work in marine systems, I either um, on the beach, so we go to um, estuaries or beaches to collect mud or, or sand. Um, and I also work in the deep sea, so uh, sometimes my field work involves going out on a boat to collect my samples. And we have um, coring equipment, so we send down these um, tubes that go down to the bottom of the ocean, sometimes thousands of meters to collect the samples. Um, so nematodes live pretty much everywhere. They live in in um, soils, so garden soil, as well as in the ocean sediments. And um, you just have to go collect your samples first because you have to get the organisms that you want to look at. And then we bring them back to the lab and we extract them from the sediment. So we're using a, a fine mesh sieve to separate the sediment from, from the nematodes. Uh, and then we have to pick them out under the microscope. That's the, uh, the time intensive part is, is extracting them and, and mounting them on slides. And we do that with um, an eyelash mounted on a glass rod. And and you're looking at the eyelash under the microscope and hooking the worm on it and then transferring it over to a slide. And, and then you put it on the microscope and you identify all the structures and the morphology. Um, and then we can actually get DNA from the same worm. So then we take it off the microscope and we um, put it into a little tube and we extract DNA from it. And we are doing DNA barcoding most of the times uh, at first. So we're, we're amplifying a gene region, which is uh, informative and in identifying species. We use 18S ribosomal RNA, which is a, a gene that encodes the ribosome. So it's, it's very conserved because everything has a ribosome. It's important uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, and then we can um, try to match up the morphology with the gene sequences to see if we have two things that look the same, um, if they're the same at the molecular level. Um, so that's, that's, that's most of the research that we're doing. And that's how you get nematodes. <laughs> For our listeners who may not be familiar with sequencing techniques, Dr. Rick uses nematode genes that encode for ribosomes. Ribosomes are universally present in all organisms and can be easily isolated to identify the different species present in her sediment samples. So when you are trying to match up the genes with the morphologies, is it pretty intense in terms of working in a lab? Uh, is there a lot of computation involved? Because you mentioned you moved on to computation uh, in your postdoctoral work. Well, firstly, how was the trans transition from being a biologist into the computational side of things and how does it how is it helping now with the research that you're doing yeah, so uh, the computational side of things comes in when you're doing uh, what we call high throughput sequencing so I, I mentioned that we we can pick nematodes, we can pick individual worms from our samples and put them into tubes, but in practice, that's really uh, labor intensive. So nowadays, the way we're trying to to move in terms of research is actually uh, uh, eliminating that step. So we're trying to just take a handful of mud and extract all the DNA from that handful of mud without even looking at the worms, and then sequence everything that's in there. So you get just a mass of sequencing data, all these different DNA sequences mm -hmm. from these different organisms. And then you have to try and figure out what species of nematode and other other animals that you have in there. So that's where the computation comes in because you have to uh, take that data set and digest it and try to process it. And um, you go from getting a very large text file to um, hopefully a figure that you can put into your publication. So that requires computational skills because you're you're dealing with such a large file and there's all these uh, uh, the, all this information that's hidden in the file. Uh, and you have to try and extract that and, and generate hypotheses and, and test them and, mm -hmm. and look at species in different samples. Um, so the computation only comes in when you try and make this leap from um, classical morphology to uh, high throughput sequencing ways of doing things and, you know, in a genomic kind of manner. Yeah. But then one of the issues ends up being taking all of this like large data sets and then making it, taking it kind of back to the biology. Like what does all of this mean? Um, and, I definitely, if if you were all computation, that would be really difficult because you don't necessarily know all the biology. Um, so it actually probably helps in your case to have both the biology understanding and the computational understanding so you can try to link those. Yeah, and that's why we, even though I say it's hard to pick out individual worms uh, under the microscope, it's 
actually really informative because we get the morphology and we can say, all right, this, this nematode looks like this and then it has this DNA sequence. So we can link that, that, you know, the mouth parts to that specific DNA sequence. And then we can actually go and look in these huge data sets that we get from a handful of mud and we can try and, and, and find that specific DNA sequence in, in the, um, you know, the messy environmental data set. So the way, yeah, in practice, the way we try and link things is to combine the morphological uh, approach with the just sequence everything approaches and hopefully um, help them inform each other. So uh, you mentioned that you uh, work with ADNS data to identify what lives in the samples that you get. Uh, has there been an attempt to get the functional information of what they do in, in the ecosystem or is that something uh, for the future? We know they are numerous, so they're really abundant in uh, estuaries and the deep sea and all types of marine sediments. So we know there's a lot of nematodes out there. We know there's a lot of different species, so they ha definitely have different, uh, you know, you have a lot of different nematode mouth parts all swimming around in one sediment. And um, so, yeah, because they're numerically abundant and they're uh, diverse, they, um, they must be doing something important in the sediment. So we think that they probably play a role in, in nutrient cycling. Uh, if you have nematodes eating bacteria um, and then, uh, you know, or they're scavenging dead things if they're eating, um, you know, other other dead animals that are living in, in the bottom of the ocean, then they're, they're going to be uh, passing that through their gut tract and cycling the nutrients. Um, so most likely they are playing significant roles in, you know, carbon turnover, nitrogen, phosphorus turnover, all these um, important nutrients, but we um, don't really have any empirical evidence to, to pinpoint what exactly they're doing. So functional information tends to come from the, the taxonomy side of things because we actually don't know much about nematode ecology. I mean, there's anecdotal evidence and there's some reports a lot, a lot of times in the older literature. Um, but we, in practice, we can't culture nematodes. So we don't have a lab model organism where we can observe for the most part, with some exceptions, there are some species that you can culture. Um, but for the most part, if we isolate a nematode from the environment, we have to infer what its morphology is. So we do that by looking at the, the structures. Um, um, the mouth parts of nematodes are what we uh, use to infer the morphology, uh, the ecology. So if we say a nematode has a small mouth, it's probably eating bacteria. Uh, if a nematode has a lot of teeth and has a, quite a large mouth, then we say it's a predator and it's it's most likely eating other nematodes and uh, other um, small animals that are living in the sediments. So uh, that's the and there are taxonomic classification schemes which group nematodes uh, into uh, feeding ecology groups based on those mouth parts. But in practice, I mean, uh, we can't really tell that from the genomic data at this point unless you match the DNA barcode to a known morphology and then infer what the mouth parts probably look like. Is there an attempt to do a meta-analysis of trying to sequence nematodes and their environment, like bacteria or the other uh, biological species that live with and around nematodes to get an uh, bigger ecological view of what it does in its environment. We are just starting to do that type of work. So we have um, uh, started to use high throughput sequencing technologies and, and um, this massive DNA sequencing to look at nematode microbiomes. The, the, benefit of working on nematodes is that because you can isolate single organisms, we can put a nematode into a tube and then sequence everything in that tube. So we get not only information about the nematode itself, but we get information about um, the microbiome, the gut contents, any sort of fungal taxa that might be associated with the nematode. And uh, that will all come through in the sequencing data. And we know that there's uh, there are interesting bacterial nematode associations in the environment. So there's one nematode that lives in seagrasses that has a a coat of bacteria on the outside of its skin. Uh, it, it's cuticle, which is what the body covering is called. And um, yeah, it just has a shag carpet of bacteria that coats it. And the, the nematode uh, moves in, in the sediments in seagrasses, which are rich in sulfide, and the bacteria feed off the sulfide. So the nematode is, is you know, transporting the bacteria so it can feed on its, its, its food source. Um, and those are, uh, and then you also have another nematode, which lives in, um, 
uh, also lives in the deep sea, which has the same sort of bacteria, but inside its body. So it's, this is a nematode called Astemonema, which has um, basically lost its gut. And instead of a gut, it has just, uh, it's, it's a basically, it's a nematode that is a tube that's packed with bacteria. And um, it's the same sort of thing. So the, the, ne- the bacteria rely on uh, sulfide, I believe, and they are, uh, you know, the nematode is transporting the bacteria around. And that's a, a, like what we call an endosymbiont because the bacteria are inside the nematode. Um, it doesn't have a mouth anymore. So it's, it's, there's some mm-hmm. really cool examples of, of bacterial nematode associations that are, we know are out in the environment. Data visualization is a big part of research. Figures are what you use to communicate your results. You have worked extensively on data visualization. So how do you incorporate uh, good data visualization practices into your research? And how should they be used by science in general? So taxonomy is a type of data visualization. So I, I, I like to think that I actually started out doing data visualization in the most uh, historical way possible. And that's putting things on microscopes and, and looking at it and drawing, uh, Im- drawing specimens. And now that I use genomic data, we've lost that. Uh, so we deal with mostly text files. So just these large, um, 30 gigabyte files of text. And that's what our DNA sequences come uh, as when we uh, get them back from the facilities that that sequence them. And so now uh, the challenge is really to come up with ways to better be able to explore this massive amount of data. And um, part of the work that we do in my lab is to come up with new solutions for uh, doing this type of research in the big data era. And one of those solutions that we've stumbled upon is data visualization. So um, I've worked closely with a uh, data visualization studio in Oakland uh, called Pitch Interactive. And together we've developed a prototype tool which allows us to take these text files and turn them into, um, using a web browser, turn them into colors and shapes and patterns, so representing different species in our molecular data sets. And the goal is to um, look at our data in a different way. So uh, if we can visualize nematode species as different colors, maybe that will help us interpret the ecological patterns or it'll help us interpret the the diversity of nematodes in our data set in a way that we wouldn't be able to do if we were looking at text files. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, and I think it just generally increases the efficiency of research because a lot of what we do as scientists is we sit at computers and we write code or we deal with these programs, software programs that are really difficult to install and run. And um, so we spend a lot of time into just generating basic visuals even for our data sets just because of the way that scientific software is is um is used in science nowadays and um we need to have more ways where we can quickly explore our data and and just like i said spot patterns and outliers and um if we have data visualization frameworks to do that in a, in a very rapid way then i think that will benefit science by speeding it up and making it more efficient i know one of the things specifically um with this project in particular is like kind of using these more basic visuals to really help fuel hypothesis driving so that you can then go on, get more data, and then kind of improve those figures, make them a little bit more biologically relevant and more even more informative rather than spending so much time just getting to the point where like, oh, I don't even know what's going on. I, how can I even kind of approach a hypothesis if I have no idea what's going on in all this data that I have? Um, so that actually seems really useful um, just in the helping with using your data to go back, drive hypothesis so you can keep going and doing even more research, driving more questions. Uh, I think that's actually really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think that, uh, yeah, we the way we formulate hypotheses is based on what we see in the figures. And if we can rapidly change our figures, say – in genomic data sets, if we see a contaminant that we know is a, you know, like C. elegans in the lab is, uh, I would remove that from my data sets. Um, then we can regenerate the figure and, and it might change based on that removal of that one species. Or we filter our data in a specific way. Maybe we, um, throw away all, um, 
of species within a particular group, or we throw away um, any non-nematode sequences. And then we look at that in conjunction with our, our, our environmental metadata, so things like pH and salinity and temperature, um, sediment grain size, whether it's sandy or muddy. And if we can put that all together really quickly, then our brains can formulate those hypotheses. And, and I think our figures will be better, and I think our science will be better for it. Yeah, um, especially just in the it, that will then like kind of improve on the side of communicating that research in right. to uh, in journals in articles make it really much easier for other scientists to kind of build from that work because it'll be kind of a better baseline understanding. Oh, that's what's going on. I can kind of work with that. Um, yeah. Also, there are so many data sets that are being generated by the public nowadays. Uh, there's the beer microbiome and the wine <laughs> oh. microbiome, and I've even seen belly button microbiome and um, <laughs> the American Gut Project. And there's all these data sets where we're generating a lot of uh, sequence data from different different places and different people and, and focusing yeah. on different themes. and. It's really hard for people without science training to engage with these genomic data sets because it's just, it's, it's a lot of data and, um, the pipelines that we use to process the data is really complicated. So I think visualization, coming up with good visualization tools mm -hmm. is, is important for helping people to engage with data that they, they potentially help to generate themselves. Maybe mm -hmm. it came from their own belly button and they want to look at their own data because they have that personal connection with it. But if we don't have the tools to, for them to do so, then they are, they're not going to be um, direct, directly involved with those data sets. So I, I think there's a lot of applications in, like you said, citizen science and education and, and teaching and training and um, even, you know, in a museum setting, having people interact with, with genomic data, the way that they interact uh, with a, you know, dinosaur specimens that are yeah. physical objects. What do you think the scientists sh should do in order to incorporate, I guess, get on social media to publicize about their science and their work? Uh, how is it helping scientific community in general uh, in relation to uh, public engagement? I use social media because I think it's fun. I got involved with Twitter and blogging uh, during my first postdoc when I was uh, a little bit isolated. So I was working up at the University of New Hampshire, which is not a major city. And for me, social media was a way to stay engaged with my friends and colleagues in the scientific community, even mm -hmm. if I wasn't physically close to them or in a major city where I could see them in person. Um, but I also think that having a, a public voice for your, your science, um, Things like the conferences that you go to is important because it's uh, it helps you build up a reputation, which I think in this day and age is is really important for young scientists. Um, if your name is out there, if people know who you are and they know your work, then you are. I I, I personally believe I think you're going to get more opportunities that come your way versus if you were cloistered away and didn't do any social media. Even even something basic like having a website, I'm always surprised at how many grad students and postdocs don't have their information on a basic website. Website. So if you don't have one, you should you should set up a website as soon as possible, especially if you're looking for jobs. Um, and I say this from the point of view of someone who's organized. Uh, I organize seminars. I organize conference symposia. I'm, uh, I'm an editor, uh, subject editor for um, Molecular Ecology, and which is a journal in my field. And I find reviewers and speakers by Googling people, looking at their Twitter profiles, getting recommendations online. And... Um, that's most of the time through my own searching. So if you don't have a footprint online, then you might be missing out on opportunities without even knowing it. Yeah. Uh, what are some misconceptions in, in your field specifically? Like either uh, misconceptions of other scientists have about your field or that the public has about your field? So I guess the biggest misconception is that nematodes are boring because they're not boring. They're awesome. And that they have no morphology. So the joke is that nematodes all look the same because they're just these tiny little worms that are pointy at both ends. But that's not true. If you look at them under the microscope, they have these amazing, um, you know, mouth parts and teeth and, and spiral structures and um, cuticle patterns that are ribbed or um, um, we call them punctuated. So the more you look at nematodes, the more... Uh, the, the more beautiful they seem, I suppose, because they just do have this incredible diversity of, of um, uh, anatomical structures and body parts. 
as scientists, we are always curious about you know, the world around us. And if we all go and answer one question each in our own way, it kind of becomes like a chopped view of the world. So should there be a, an attempt to combine all of these or is there an attempt uh, and how would you go about it, I guess? I think science as a whole is becoming much less uh, siloed and less discipline focused. So I know in my own research, I, I'm using um, techniques that stem from the 1800s, if you're talking about taxonomy, all the way up to um, technology, which only became available about five years ago, if you're talking about some of the sequencing platforms. And the, the types of work we do are uh, asking these or, or testing hypotheses all the way to software development and, and doing coding. And um, that's becoming more typical. I know my lab is uh, the exception in some ways in terms of the, diver the, the huge diversity of things that we do. But um, yeah, I see it much more amongst, especially amongst younger uh, researchers. It's just the way the fields are going. Everyone needs to know more about different disciplines. And the, the teams of scientists tackling questions are getting bigger and more interdisciplinary. So it's, I know in my own work, it's, it's not very common for me to be the lone scientist working on this one project. I mean, I have collaborators across disciplines in um, statistics and ecology and phylogenetics and, um, you know, working in all these different ecosystems, soils, marine systems, and and then software development. So the, the teams that we're assembling to tackle these questions are uh, a lot more diverse. And everyone does have their own unique viewpoint, but I think people are coming together more and asking questions across disciplines in when they're formulating their grant proposals and their um, their manuscripts that they're writing. So I, I do see it changing. But I also think that that um, specific knowledge within a discipline is really important because if we don't have, for example, taxonomy inform taxonomy knowledge and that that um, understanding of the historical literature, then we're going to be repeating efforts. So having people within a discipline is still very important because that brings a, a depth of information that is not necessarily true when you're trying to do um, uh, ask questions across disciplines because right. by nature you just can't go as deep if you have to be the one person to go across all these disciplines. So I think there's um, there's a there's a place for both. But in, in practice, I think the this idea of collaborative teams where each person has very deep knowledge within one area is is uh, a pretty effective way to do science in the modern age. Say you had, you know, unlimited, like, grant just gives you all the money that you could possibly ask for, and you got to ask and pursue any question in, that you wanted. Like, what would you be able to do? Like, what would you want to pursue with that kind of unlimited bounds? I would want to go on a boat, uh, a, a research cruise all around the world and sample at as many deep sea locations as possible and design a, uh, a deep sea sampling strategy that is equivalent to what you can do in terrestrial ecology. So replicates and quadrats and, and really incredible just global set of samples across all the world's ocean basins. Um, and the reason why I need money to do that is because <laughs> ships are really expensive. They cost tens of thousands of dollars a day to run, and that takes time, and no grant would ever fund that cruise. But, yes, this is a dream. So that is my dream. <laughs> that, that does sound like a really good research trip. So, All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Bick, for joining us and telling us all about your research. Um, it was really great having you here with us. Thank you. Thanks. Today, we're signing off with Dr. Big's favorite quote. This is a quote by uh, Cobb, who is a famous nematologist. And to underline the importance of nematodes, he has a famous quote, uh, which says, quote, In short, if all the matter in the universe except the nematodes were swept away, our world would still be dimly recognizable. And if, as disembodied spirits, we could then investigate it, we should find its mountains, hills, vales, rivers, lakes, and oceans represented by a film of nematodes. The location of towns would be decipherable, since for every massing of human beings, there would be a corresponding massing of certain nematodes. Trees would still stand in ghostly rows representing our streets and highways. The location of, of the various plants and animals would still be decipherable, and had we sufficient knowledge, in many cases, even their species could be determined by an examination of their erstwhile nematode parasites.
Radio Bio is supported by the Quantitative and Systems Biology Graduate Group and the Graduate Division at the University of California, Merced. For more information, you can visit our website at radiobio.net or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram.